Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. And Lee Justo from Risk. And this is episode number five of Finance Unspun. So, Lee, we wanted to do like a 30,000 foot view for today's episode. There's a lot of crazy things going on. The major thing that we wanted to talk about at the top here of this 30,000 foot view is the dollar rally that's been going on now for over a month. Um, we're recording this show on Monday, July 11th, 2022. The dollar index is over 108 at 108.43. A lot of that is because of a weak Japanese yen, a weak euro. But if you are a foreign government, if you are a foreign corporation, it doesn't really matter why the dollar is rallying. The dollar rallying is causing immense problems on top of these already immense problems that we've been talking about on prior episodes like the food and energy crisis, supply chain shortages, the Fed hiking interest rates. All of these problems now, Lee, especially this dollar rally, are just compounding on each other and making things even worse for emerging markets. Yeah, let's start talking about Sri Lanka here because uh, that's been in the news a lot. The, the country is in total chaos president uh presidential home was actually mobbed and he resigned so let, let's talk about what caused this over the past few years uh you allude to the dollar getting strong uh certainly a, a big factor in it how exactly does that play a role in a country like sri lanka blowing up economically so these uh foreign governments and foreign corporations normally it's emerging markets but also in china when the dollar is actually weekly, a lot of the seeds are planted for potential problems later. And this is unfortunately a problem with the current system that we have. Now, small government, small or limited government, a international gold standard, it actually settled global trade imbalances. It actually fixed things. But the current system we have post Bretton Woods with the dollar standard and debt-based fiat currencies, this is a problem now where if the dollar gets too strong, we have over 13 trillion now in dollar denominated debt from foreign governments and foreign corporations outside of the United States. That's not even counting the amount of dollar denominated debt that's in the euro dollar market. I've seen Jeffrey Snyder and others say it's at least 17 trillion. I don't know. I think that was like over a year or two ago when they said that estimate. So there's a lot of dollar denominated debt out there. And unfortunately, and I talked about this on, on an, uh, a number of tweets over the last couple of weeks, this is like a cycle. So in 2021, the dollar index was very weak. And you saw in the mainstream financial media, you saw a lot of experts, you saw Peter Schiff and others talk about the dollar was going to crash, the dollar was going to get weak. I think David Hunter, who's always wrong on his predictions, he was saying the dollar index was going to go to 85 or lower. He was calling me a bunch of names on Twitter. But the way the cycle works with this global dollar standard is, and there was a near record because the dollar was so weak and a lot of people were trying to capitalize on that trend, you saw a lot of foreign governments, especially emerging markets, and a lot of foreign corporations borrow more in dollars. But, and again, this goes into the cycle that's been happening. And we had this cycle in 2019 before the pandemic and the shutdown. The global economy was in peril in 2019. As the dollar is weak and more dollars are borrowed, it creates future demand for more dollars to pay back later. And then the Fed starts hiking interest rates, Lee, and then that starts to strengthen the dollar. And then the dollar starts to rally. And then all of those global macro hedge fund managers and bond fund managers and other people that were telling people to buy U.S. treasuries and that were shorting the dollar, <laughs> then the dollar starts to rally. And yep. then once the dollar starts to rally, it creates like a vicious cycle, a margin call. And then so the rate hikes plus the dollar rally starts to feed on itself. And that huge pile of dollar denominated debt it becomes more and more onerous on top of all the other problems. So Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka exports, I, I was looking this up a couple of days ago. I sent you um, the official numbers on exports. I think Sri Lanka exports a lot of uh, consumer products to the United States. I think it's mostly textiles, but they also import a lot of food. They were um, they had a, a a paper shortage. I think they couldn't import the amount of uh, paper they needed for their uh, schools for school children. They couldn't import the amount of diesel. But the way the international markets work, Lee, is that you, uh, in this dollar standard that we have post bread and woods. You need to accumulate if you're a foreign government, especially an emerging market. You need to have a big pile of U.S. dollars. 
So in the past, you could do it with gold. That would balance international trade, especially with small government. But in the current system, you need to have a big pile of U.S. dollars to run trade surpluses, um, to boost. Uh, so you have uh, on your exports, you uh, run trade surpluses, you build up a large foreign exchange reserve of U.S. dollars. So in a rainy day scenario, if things go bad with your government finances, if you have crop failures, you can go and buy diesel. You can go and buy natural gas. You can go and buy food crops, staple crops. You can go and buy these things and pay an extra price on an international commodities market or with a large food supplier or energy supplier. And this is where Sri Lanka, and there's other reasons why, but Sri Lanka did not have the US dollars they needed to go and buy that diesel, to go and buy that um, those staple crops. Well, you know, in a sense, what you're, you're saying here is that the dollar pretty much has replaced gold in international trade. And as opposed to gold, where it's just a fixed commodity and a fixed amount, uh, there are many forces in within governments and central banks that actually manipulate the value of the dollar in relation to other currencies. Would you agree with that? So the dollar is still king for all capital markets. The yep. U.S. still has the major capital markets. That's where the majority of capital wants to come. You do not see investments in nearly uh, the size of investments that go into U.S. real estate, that go into U.S. stock market, that go into the U.S. bond market, that go into all these other different markets. The U.S. has the major uh, the derivatives market is still majority controlled by the U.S. Although the the um, LBMA and others have in London have a significant amount of the derivatives as well, but U.S. banks also uh, control a lot of that. So the the U.S., the dollar, and also the other major thing about the dollar, and you see all these articles about like, well, there are all these foreign governments, so whether it's China, Russia, the BRICS, they're working alternative systems. As long as the U.S. has a majority of investment into their capital markets, as long as the U.S. has the largest amount of global trade settlement, and this is a key here. So like international global trade, you have foreign corporations, you have foreign governments for international trade. And these are countries that are not even trading with the US Lee, and they're still settling in dollars like Japan and Sweden, or Canada and Peru, or these other different types of countries. They have nothing to do when they're doing their different types of global trade or foreign corporations in these countries, they have nothing to do with US companies or the US government, and they're still settling in US dollars. We're over, I believe, 60% of global trade settlement in US dollars. Until that drastically goes down, this dollar standard system that we're on is still king. Oh, absolutely. No, no doubt about it. You know, we, we were talking about um, Sri Lanka, and I think it was on our last show, you mentioned... Uh, windfall taxes that they were talking about them here. Uh, one of the problems, I think, in Sri Lanka, I, I heard a, a newscaster blaming it on tax cuts that the government had done uh, just like a, a couple of years ago. But they failed to mention that Sri Lanka's um, percentage of the government's budget has exploded over the past few years. Uh, so they're spending more and more. I mean, it was... 9.8%. Um, and now it's up to, I think, 13.3%. I mean, that's a... And how much do and how much of that spending increases, how much was borrowed in debt, dollar denominated debt? So I can, I can guess that when the dollar was weak, normally what these emerging markets, these foreign governments and foreign corporations will do is they will try to play the currency game. So when the dollar gets weak, they, they, uh, they uh, double down, they would take a big risk. And they're betting that the dollar will remain weak or get weaker, but that's normally not what happens. They they bet that the Fed would not raise interest rates, and the Fed will eventually have to stop raising interest rates, Lee, or the Fed's going to crash all of the U.S. real estate market and home prices. So if the Fed continues, Absolutely. yeah. So if the Fed continues to raise interest rates, they're going to crash the U.S. real estate, and then guess what? The Fed's going to have to buy even more. Uh, U.S. Treasuries, even more mortgage-backed securities are going to have to buy commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities. They're going to have to give BlackRock and other subsidized loans to go and buy real estate to prop that up because all levels of government here in the U.S. are reliant on high real estate prices. So if real estate does crash like in 2007 and 2009, you'll have the state, local, and federal governments within three to six months, their tax revenues will collapse again. And then the buyer of last resort to fund government is the Federal Reserve Bank. I was going to say the Fed. Right, let me let me correct my uh, my statistics on Sri Lanka. Their um, spending was 12.2% of their GDP in 2014, and it ratcheted up to 17% of GDP this year. So 
But to me, that's a huge increase in government spending that they're just not even talking about. And Sri Lanka's majority exports, I think, were um, like clothing. So they were and, and eye masks, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I sent you, I sent you a picture of that, but that's just one example. I mean, they I they made um, they weren't making value added products. Although in this consumer environment with consumer discretionary income rapidly depleting thanks to high food and energy prices and currency debasement, I mean, consumer discretionary items in the near future, they're going to, the consumers are not going to have the budget for that. But you have all these governments, though, especially like in 2020, 2021, they increased government spending. They, uh, they printed an enormous amount, well, created an enormous amount of their own currency units. A lot of these central banks went up to around 40% of their government debt. They bought around 40%. They went from 10% or less of owning total amounts of government debt up to 40%. This created an enormous amount of currency debasement, inflation, stagflation, distortions. You have government rules and regulations and taxes hurting small businesses and supply chain problems. As we talked about earlier, the governments just cannot excuse me, the markets and especially emerging mar um, capital markets and especially emerging markets cannot deal with all these different factors happening at the same time. With a strong dollar, when you borrowed more de dollar denominated debt last year in 2021, the dollar rally, with the Fed hiking interest rates, with a food and energy crisis, with supply chain problems, there's just too many things to deal with. And then this hurts the US consumer and the US consumer is the main driver for a lot of these emerging markets as well. So well, I, I think the current global economy is built on a weak dollar. Yeah, I agree. And a, an aggressive consumer in, in the United States. And uh, I think we're seeing both of those things change, although, although I'm sure that the dollar will pull back from its crazy rally uh, over the next couple of weeks. I mean, it looks so overextended now, but I think the longer term picture for now is a stronger dollar. Would you agree? Well, the Fed will, the Fed and U.S. Treasury will have to, if the dollar rally continues, the Fed and U.S. Treasury will do what they've done in 2008, 2009, and 2020. They will change the rules. They may change the rules often. They will announce new liquidity programs. They will announce publicly that there are these currency swap lines available to a bunch of different foreign central banks. They may even buy the dollar denominated debt of foreign corporations. We don't know. They do these secret bailouts. Sometimes we find out about them later and sometimes we don't. And then unfortunately with these US dollar currency swap lines, Lee, and I found this out um, with Fed disclosures over the years, they just waive the loans later. So the Fed says that these currency swap lines are emergency. They're only temporary. They may only last six months or a year. It's not a big deal. But then you find out that the currency swap lines in the case of the European Union were still being drawn in 2011. Um, they were being drawn during the pigs crisis in 2013-14. They were being drawn, the currency swap lines by the European Central Bank and large, and large European banks were in trouble again during the Brexit crisis. So this, and then there's always derivatives failures now because of the amount of leverage in the system and, and um, how these large banks in the US and European Union are basically hedge funds that are bailed mm -hmm. out by central mm -hmm. banks, that mm -hmm. now there's derivatives problems every two to five years. And if the Fed keeps hiking interest rates, that's going to blow up even more derivatives. These interest rate swaps are the largest amount of derivatives out of all the derivatives. I think there's over 300 trillion of these interest rate swaps. And the large banks in the US and European Union were on the betting on interest rates going down side. That was the majority of their bets. <laughs> right. But I mean, how much lower could they possibly go? I mean, we're going to see negative interest rates in this country, you think, at some point? Well, unfortunately, the end game is Japanification. So, yeah. and Japan's not even doing well now because Japan- No, Japan, Japan's okay. in real trouble. So the, the entire global economy, Lee, you were saying it's based on a weak dollar. I would also argue it's based on cheap energy, but we don't have cheap energy- we don't have cheap energy now. So we have a case now where a emerging market, I'll, I'll give an example like Brazil. So the Brazil elections, the minimum wage in Brazil is so low that a lot of poor people in Brazil, a quarter of their monthly income now is going towards gasoline and diesel costs. So is that's not cheap energy. That's my point. You have Japan, you have the European Union, which were in the past, they didn't have to spend as much of their uh, trade imbalance excuse me, they didn't have to spend as much of their foreign exchange reserves. They could run trade surpluses. They were not running negative trade balances, importing food and energy. And now they are because of stagflation, the supply chain problems, high energy prices, which spill into food. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in energy. 
uh, and, and how it's impacting the global economy. I mean, obviously, the, the supply chain issues were there before, but I, I think this is exa- as I, excuse me exacerbated them. Um, and now we're talking about Europe and natural gas. I mean, they're in trouble right now with natural gas, aren't they? I mean, they're they're extremely dependent on it, and they're they're running out of sources of it. And I think I think everyone is. In, I sent you another article from Oil Price that came yeah. out today that. Yes, the European Union is in trouble for liquefied natural gas, but they're taking all of the natural gas and liquefied natural gas exports. They're taking it away from emerging markets. Mm-hmm. So this is this is um, there's not enough supply. There's not cheap energy, and you have all these ESG policies and bad policies from governments that are not fixing the energy and food problems. And it's it seems like the bad policies are still accumulating daily. And this is widely, and you mentioned Sri Lanka. I mean, there are protests now just over the last couple of weeks. There's protests now in many different countries and governments over high food and energy prices, shortages. Uh, we could just name some of them. I'm sure there's going to be more. Emerging markets, unfortunately, are going to take the brunt of this for now, the European Union too as well. So you have like Albania, Bulgaria, Ecuador, Macedonia, Sri Lanka, and I'm sure there's going to be others in the coming weeks and months because the global economy is not set up for a strong dollar and is not set up for high food and energy prices. I don't think it's set up for the ESGs either. (laughs) Oh, you mean windmills and solar power in (laughs) Germany and Texas are not a good idea? (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine if all the skyscrapers in Manhattan had windmills on top of them? I think a lot of birds would die. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Just, I think uh, the, the, go ahead. The, the bad policies are, are a total joke at this point. I mean, Gavin Newsom is running an ad calling like uh, DeSantis like a dictator and anti-freedom. <laughs> and this is the guy in California who had the worst yeah. like post draconian laws. Of course, I know. It's just, uh, it astounds me the level that these people will go to with their campaigns and but nothing surprises me anymore. You know, there, there's also been uh, a few, actually, um, fires and explosions at, at some natural gas and other uh, plants uh, in the United States. I mean, I know recently there was one at the Oniac plant in Oklahoma uh, after a fire. So h- how much impact do you think that these occurrences are going to have on the price and, and supply of natural gas domestically? The U.S. is going to be exporting a lot more liquefied natural gas in the coming years. I think the capacity is going to double by 2030, and a lot of these liquefied natural gas plants are under construction now. So, And you're starting to see more mergers and acquisitions in the U.S. natural gas space. So even at the current natural gas price, let me just pull it up right now. The natural gas price is... It's come come down substantially. I think it was like above nine about a month ago. It's down to around six. I mean, six is still, uh, it's down, but six is still a very healthy number for the U.S. natural gas producers. A lot of the U.S. natural gas producers actually hedged at a higher price. So they're still minting free cash flow. Even at six or five, a lot of U.S. natural gas producers are still making very good profit margins and free cash flow. And um, we're seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the natural gas space and oil. I think Warren Buffett just bought another $10 billion worth of Occidental Petroleum shares. I mean, he's getting closely to 40 or 50% of the company. Mr. Some, Mr. ESG himself. Well, he's looking at profits. He's looking at free cash flow. He's looking yep. at dividend increases. And if I were to look at sectors, and I wrote an article on this for patrons about a week ago, if I were to look at sectors, different sectors, where are good bets over the next couple of years for dividend, more free cash flow or maintaining free cash flow or growing free cash flow and dividend growth, I would be more likely to bet on dividend growth out of oil and natural gas, liquefied natural gas company, pipeline company. So the energy sector, throughout the energy sector, really, and also fertilizer companies versus a lot of these consumer discretionary companies that are having profit margin contraction. Politicians are going to force wages. Politicians and bureaucrats and unions are going to force wages higher. Are these consumer discretionary companies that historically in recessions or depressions been known for maintaining profit margins and growing dividends these consumer staple companies, are they going to be able to maintain or grow their dividends? And I would say based on what we're seeing with stagflation and taxes, forced labor cost increases, it might not be as likely as it was in the past. So I think this 
stagflation, this type of stagflation, and politicians are already talking about raising taxes for companies, uh, small businesses, it could be different than past recessions or depressions where utilities and consumer staple stocks tended to do well with dividend growth. Uh, I was going to say, so you, you think traditionally it, it, people would shift into more of a conservative portfolio. They'd go to the Procter and Gamble and utility. And so you, you, you think that formula may not work this time. I think you're seeing the bets from David Einhorn, from Stanley Druckenmiller, from Warren Buffett. I think you're seeing that they're betting that it will not be the same as in the right, past. So right. Buffett is tending to leave a lot of his consumer staple, um, consumer discretionary companies. And he's moving, and along with Einhorn too, he's moving into oil and energy because they expect this oil and energy crisis to last for years. So you're talking about like the U.S. and natural gas supply. The U.S., even though natural gas prices are higher here in the U.S., we still have a lot of natural gas. We still have mm -hmm. good pipelines. Yes, we don't have the Keystone pipeline, so we would have even cheaper um, heavy sour crude coming down here, more supply for the refiners to make diesel, more energy-dense products. But other countries, it's way, way worse. I mean, emerging markets are getting absolutely destroyed right now. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Because I, I think we're going to see a lot more Sri Lankas over the next couple of months. And I and I hate to see it too, but if you compound the problems again, and maybe want to wrap wrap it up with this, with the continued dollar rally, and at some point again, the Fed and the U.S. Treasury, unless they want to see everything collapse, like in two thousand nine or twenty twenty, unless they want to see emerging markets just all start to go Sri Lanka because of the amount of dollar denominated debt. And we had a near record amount of dollar denominated debt increase in 2021 when the dollar was weak and the dollar index, I think got down to around 89 ish. And then you had a bunch of people cause it was already weak saying it was going to 85 or lower. There was a bunch of people saying 80, 79, even lower than that. And I was like, no, 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 that's not how this cycle works. Um, the dollar for the most part, except for the last like month or so, was in a long trading range. I called it the dollar tug of war because of how this dollar system works. And when the dollar is weak, you have the foreign governments and the foreign corporations borrow more dollars. And then that creates more demand for dollars. And now on top of that, you have the Fed raising interest rates. So you're going to have to see the Fed and the US Treasury, unless they want to see things collapse, like the emerging markets collapse, like more Sri Lankas. And we're going to see lots of these videos. Oh, the other thing we didn't cover, Lee, before we wrap up, are the protests in the Netherlands because the, the mainstream financial media, the mainstream media here in the United States is not covering any of this. No, they, they aren't. And, you know, the, we, we talked uh, right before we got on air here about how there was some blame to gas station owners here domestically for the price. And you farmers. Know. Yeah, and yeah farmers. exactly. And, and I, I actually know someone who owns a gas station and they were telling me that most gas stations, at least here in New York, they just... Uh, basically rent out their pumps to the oil companies and the oil companies set the prices. So it's not even the gas station owners set the price. And, most and, guess, and guess who makes the largest profits per gallon of gasoline sold? Uh, the, the governments with their taxes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and so a lot of these studies that are coming out are not even including all the different levels of taxes at the federal, state, county, city level, all the taxes that are added on to each gallon of gasoline that you're buying. So if you added all of them up and there's very few studies that add up all the different taxes at all the different levels of government, the government is making in a lot of different cases, 80 cents to a dollar per gallon of gasoline, which is more, way more money than the gasoline station owner is making per gallon of gasoline sold. Absolutely. And yeah. way more money than the oil refiners and the oil producers that have to do all the hard work are making. It's the governments that make the money off this. And then the governments are putting the policies on and then the governments are deflecting the blame onto the gasoline station owner, who's at most the gasoline station owners making two cents a gallon. I mean, I've heard- I, I was going to say, they, ma they make under, I think, 3% on, on a, a gallon. I mean, it's- It, it, it's it depends. It depends on the city and state in the United States, but there are a lot of gasoline station owners who only make one cent a gallon. A lot of them just break even. On yeah, the, and and it's basically a lost leader for people to go into yes. their, yeah, their their um their store to buy yeah. food or whatever. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of rich Democrats out there, champagne socialists, that don't even know what a loss leader is in business. I saw a tweet from this guy, blue checkmark guy with over a hundred thousand Twitter followers. And he was saying, if Costco can sell a hot dog for a dollar 50, then, then gasoline station owners shouldn't raise their prices. And it's like, 
<laughs> Costco's Costco selling their hot dog for a dollar fifty. That is, and Lee, you brought up a loss leader. That is a loss leader. Absolutely. So, so Costco selling your rotisserie chicken for a good price. Your your slices of pizza or, or the pizzas at the um the snack cart in the hopes that you're going to buy something else while you're in there, and you usually do. Well, it's it's actually so. If you really want to understand the business for Costco, their free cash flow is all from the membership sold, and their profit margins on everything else at the store are very very razor thin. So, um, they've been adding more consumer items like clothing and stuff like that, and that's where a lot of their uh, sales growth is. Their same store sales growth. They've been adding a lot of clothing. They've been buying like excess clothing, probably some of this stuff that's made in Sri Lanka and that wasn't selling for a higher price. Costco's been buying it at wholesale prices for cheaper and offering it at a reasonable reason yeah, and offering it at a reasonable price or discount for its members. So the the perks are as a loss leader, you get uh discounted rotisserie chickens, discounted hot dogs, discounted pizza, and then you go and spend more money in Costco, your check size raises, and then you you happily pay your annual membership fee. And that's where Costco makes a ton of money is from their membership fees collected. That's their free cash flow at the business. Which which could very well change if the U.S. consumer keeps getting squeezed. Like well, and, and Co- Costco has actually done a really good job keeping um, employees happy with benefits and higher wages. So Costco is one of the very few examples where they have... Um, the employees, the management team, the shareholders, and the customers, everyone is relatively happy. And a lot of businesses are not like that synergistic where normally like a couple of those groups are getting screwed. Right. So Costco is kind of like the rare business. It's not a cheap It's not a cheap stock to go and buy. I mean, I was writing articles about it when I worked at Investing Daily as an investment analyst for my day job when the stock was like $120 a share. And even then people were saying it wasn't cheap, but I mean, the stock went up a lot. I haven't looked at it lately. But it did go up a lot over the last like seven or eight years. They, they've they, certainly they, threaded the needle well, but uh, I think it's reflected in their stock price, as you just said. But in general, though, Lee, those consumer discretionary, those consumer staple businesses, um, we talked about this, I think, in episode two or three with Walmart and Target. They're having higher cost pressure. They're having higher labor costs. They're high, having they're paying more for transportation costs and energy costs, and then they have excess inventory. So I think you're going to see a lot of that. With these consumer staple, consumer discretionary companies, and that's going to hurt their balance sheet, and that's going to hurt their um, profit margins, and that's going to hurt their ability to maintain or grow dividends. And I think that's what you're seeing with the investments now from a lot of these big name investors. They're uh, they're looking at the the financials of the company, the earnings reports, and we don't have the Q2 earnings out yet for a lot of these other companies yet. But I think it's going to reflect that more. And I think, unfortunately, Christmas time, unless you start to see a weak dollar and much cheaper food and energy prices, a weak dollar and cheaper food and energy prices would bring some relief to the consumer. But unless um, you know these major factors with Fed raising interest rates and the strong dollar and high food and energy prices, unless that changes, the trend is in for very difficult. Um, for people's consumer discretionary budgets, especially emerging markets. So you're going to see, as Lee said, more video examples of Sri Lanka. And then you're going to see, unfortunately, politicians, um, bureaucrats, regulators blame, and this is not fair at all because it wasn't their policies. You're going to see them blame farmers. It's not the it's not the fault of the farmers in the no. Netherlands that their fertilizer costs are up that they're getting squeezed with profit margins, that they've had supply chain problems, that they have- And, to, and the, di- the diesel for their tractors. I mean, yeah. they're getting squeezed everywhere. Yeah, and uh, they should to maintain, so they're profitable. They should be able to pass on higher costs to their customer. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to operate their business, but they're being vilified in public by politicians, bureaucrats, regulators that created all the problems in the first place with bad policies. And then they created all this inflation over the last two and a half years, this excess currency creation gave people stimmy checks or other um, social program spending to go and buy things. And then the economy, because politicians, bureaucrats, regulators shut down the economy, did not produce goods and services, and there's still supply chain problems. Well, I think it's the same old story and it continues. Uh, it's, it's certainly been an uh, interesting episode. The world just keeps getting more and more interesting every time we speak. So, uh, well, was, uh, the, the, and the last point to bring up, Lee, and we wanted to talk about this is that if we weren't on a dollar standard, if we didn't have debt based fiat currencies, if all these governments weren't too big, if they weren't intervening in economies. So, if we had more free markets, more capitalism, uh, if we didn't have a dollar standard and debt based fiat currencies and central banking, 
the global economy, free markets, and capitalism, small people in the real economy, in the private sector would solve these supply chain problems. Oh, absolutely. No, no question about it, Jason. I mean, and we would have, we talked about deflation, but but positive deflation, that's that's what we would have right now, where where people were making more money, they'd be able to afford more, and, and good the, the price of goods and services would be going down. And you're not seeing the amount of oil and natural gas drilling that should have been occurring no, when no. prices were high, because you're you're seeing instead Biden and the European Union going and begging to the Saudis and other OPEC countries for more natural gas and more oil, when in their own domestic areas they could have allowed this. I mean, Europe, the European Union has an enormous landmass, and oil, natural gas drilling, other than really the North Sea, it's not really allowed. So yeah. they have to import a disproportionate amount of energy into there. And there's a lot of people in the European Union. So they have to import a enormous amount of energy, same for Japan. And those economies are devastated. There's distortions, they get wrecked when they have a, uh, when the dollar is strong and when energy prices are too high, and then that spills over into food. And it so basically like, comes down to governments intervening, making things a mess, their cure is to intervene even more, which makes things even worse. And it just continues. It's a vicious cycle until it all falls down and collapses. Yes. And until the system, until we get off this dollar standard and debt-based fiat currencies, a small government eliminating central banks or drastically reducing their power and allowing gold to settle global trade, it fixed a lot of these imbalances. But unfortunately, the imbalances are going to get worse. The distortions are going to get worse. And the policy problems are not from capitalism or free markets. They're all from central banks, governments, politicians, regulators, and bureaucrats. And then the people in power who can afford $10 gasoline, who can afford to pay $80 to $100 for a nice steak now when it used to be $30, $40, $50 only six or seven years ago. So these price increases don't bother them that much. They're blaming other people for the uh, intentional policy decisions and problems and distortions that they created in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that's a good way to wrap it up there, Jason. Great. Well, this is episode number five of Finance Unspun about the dollar rally and the problems it's causing. Expect if the dollar rally continues at some point in the near future, probably in the next couple of quarters, the Fed will stop having to hike interest rates. Otherwise, they're going to have to bail out the real estate market and all levels of government too. They cause a real estate crash. It'll be very similar to 2008, 2009 a full real estate crash. I mean, we're already seeing signs, the real estate market slowing down. They cause a full real estate crash, similar to 2007, eight. It's gonna, the Fed's gonna have to do even more QE, even more purchase of mortgage-backed securities. So that's definitely something to watch in the not too distant future. And unfortunately, the emerging markets are taking a big, big hit with a strong dollar, the Fed hiking interest rates and high food and energy prices, a disproportionate hit the way the current financial system is set up with the dollar standard. Well, thank you so much, Jason. It's always fascinating to talk to you. I just, you kind of astound me sometimes with some of the stuff you come out with that, you know. <laughs>